Director of the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center at the Consulate General of India in Durban, Dr. Chaitanya Prakash Yogi, colleagues Ms. Cheryl Banwarilal, Ms. Kavita Salanki, Mr. Piyush Kandelwal, guests Mr. Mohan Naya, Mr. Deepak Kumar Chaudhary, Ms. Fari Jamwal, Mr. Vikram Jamwal, Ms. Gita Joshi, distinguished guests and online members. It gives me great pleasure in welcoming you all to today's sixth day of India Heritage Week celebrations. Without further ado, I'd like to present to you Ms. Kavita Salanki for her song rendition this evening. Thank you, Shishti Ji. Namaskar, everyone. It's a beautiful spiritual song. In this song, uh, I'm trying to explain the spiritual journey in our entire body from Muladhar to Sahastrar Chakra. कुटी महल चढ़ देख पियारे जागे ज्योति अबाराओ सो हम सो हम जपते जपते पहुँचो दस दे द्वाराओ मेरु दंड में बंक नाल है उल्टी गंग कहावे ओ उसी गंग में सुन लो प्यारे जो कोई घुस कर नावे ओ प्रणव यान से ऊचा चढ़ कर सुख मणि गढ़ में जावे ओ वहाँ से ऊँचा बेहद ऊँचा ब्रह्म शिखर पे जावे ओम ओम ध्वनि से चढ़ते चढ़ते निश्चल घुमरी आवे ओम अपने आप आप अपने में निर्विकल्प निर्वाणियो शिवानंद गुरु केवल चेतन निजानंद आनंदियो प्रिकुटी महल चढ़ देख पियारे जागे ज्योति अपाराओ सो हम सो जपते जपते पहुँचो दस बेद्वाराओ पहुँचो दस बेद्वाराओ थैंक यू धन्यवाद थैंक यू सो मच कविता जी फॉर द मेलोडियस सॉन्ग our first speaker this evening is Mr. Mohan Naya, a social activist and entrepreneur based in Durban, South Africa. He is going to speak on his heritage and legacy on the state of Kerala. In a big country like India, Kerala is a very small state tucked away right in the, in the southern tip. It's a state that has been called various names like Spice Garden of India, Land of Coconut, Land of Trees. However, the most popular one is God's Own Country. I'm intrigued by this title and, and question myself, is this created by Kerala Tourism as a part of their marketing campaign or is there actual truth in it? I tried to look at the literal meaning of the words and ask myself, if God had to actually come to earth and make a country of his own, what kind of a country will that be? To answer this, I did a bit of study and listed 10 unique features that would constitute God's country. I then compared with Kerala to see how it measures up. Before I start the list, I want to make it clear that these are my personal observations and you're welcome to draw your own conclusion. So let's begin. Number one, if God is making his own country on earth, Surely it has to be like a paradise. Hence, it's good to know that National Geographic has named Kerala as one of the 10 paradises of the world. And so its gentle backwaters, 
lush green rolling hills, rice field, and pristine beaches together create a kind of beauty that is soothing to the soul. And it's not seasonal, but all through the year, an essential requirement for a place to be classified as a paradise. Number two, if God creates a paradise for himself, surely he would like to keep it clean. Interestingly, Kerala has been voted as the cleanest city in India. Number three, in paradise, we can only imagine joyful children. A child welfare report published recently studied 24 different indicators, including health, education, human rights, and family income of all Indian states, and showed that the happiest children in India are in, guess what, Kerala. Number four, uh, in God's country, he will not let women be treated inferior and made to suffer as they are in most part of our male dominated world. Kerala in contrast has been traditionally matriarchal in nature and therefore women are never discriminated against. Women are all, are all educated and financial independence is a traditionally an important thing for them. Number five, in the land of the Lord, surely the light of knowledge will be spread to all people. Now Kerala was declared fully literate from as long back as 1991. In fact, roots of literacy can be traced back to Hindu rulers of 19th century. In 1817, the Queen of Trivandrum issued a decree that read as follows, quote, the state would, should defray entire cost of education of its people in order that there is no backwardness in the spread of enlightenment, unquote. And so education has had a good head start in Kerala, not just compared to other states in India, but most parts of the world as well. To be rich, number, number six. To be rich in culture is essential, and so is Kerala. It's the only state in India to have two recognized traditional dance, like the Kathakali and Mohiniyattam. Combine this with the festivities of Onam, snake dance, race, and many folklore, and cultures don't get richer. Number seven, in, in God's country, you expect God himself to be extremely wealthy. And so it is that Kerala's Padmaswami temple is famous as the richest place of worship in the world, having gold estimates of only 17 billion US dollars. Um, number eight, um, in his country, God wants, will want to see his people healthy. And so in Kerala, we have Ayurveda as an intrinsic cultural heritage. The word Ayurveda itself means the science of long life and is about promoting good health and not fighting disease and relies on maintaining a good, a right balance between mind, body and spirit. Personally, I suffered severe backaches for many years and owe it to Kerala's Ayurveda to have it sorted out. Number nine, in the Lord's country, you expect simplicity in people's lifestyle. And that's exactly what we see in the traditional food and dress of Keralites. A simple half sari of women and a lungi for men called mundu. What's interesting is that they are all white in color, the color of purity. Even for marriages, Keralites wear white. This simplicity extends to every aspect of traditional lifestyle. With agriculture still the mainstay of the state, Keralites are rooted to their soil. Let me give you a personal example. A year or so back, I joined my brother and sisters on a visit to Kerala to visit an aunt who had turned 100. My aunt, still healthy and active, read aloud poems and told us stories about our father as a youngster that we never knew about. Inspired by this evening, we decided to visit all other relatives in Kerala who are 80 years old at least. Anyone less younger than 80 did not make the cut. Still, we ended up visiting close to a dozen of our relatives and were outstuck on how they still kept themselves active and in good spirits. Live example of the power of simple, disciplined and traditional Kerala lifestyle. Number 10. Lastly, and perhaps most interesting reason to call Kerala God's own country is because of because of mythology. Kerala 
itself was created by God. Yes, that's true. Legend has it that Lord Parashurama, the sage warrior and an incarnation of Lord Vishnu created Kerala. As a warrior, he had killed many Brahmins. And so as a mark of repentance, he meditated to Lord Varuna, the Lord of Ocean, and asked for a land for Brahmins so they can live peacefully. Lord of Ocean granted his boon and told him to fling his axe towards the sea. The sea, the sea uh, in the direction of the sea in the direction of the axe moved out and a strip of land was formed and thus Kerala was created. I don't know how true the story is, but today we see typical Kerala Keralites has a bit of sage and a bit of warrior in them, just like L Lord Parashurama. The sage part comes since they invest in education at the start of their lives. Then the warrior part comes comes out when they start looking for job and travel fearlessly and with no hesitation to, to remote corners of the world. The teachers who came to work in remote parts of South Africa is a good example. Kerala's have a risk-taking appetite far more than any other states in India. The saint warrior spirit of Lord Parashurama lives on. And Kerala truly does live up to the name God's own country. Thank you. Thank you so much for the Amnaya for those very insightful uh, remarks on Kerala. We will now be playing a short video on the state of Kerala. Mudida. <laughs> 
quite delighted to be here and really enriched by uh, Mr. Mohan Nair's uh, presentation earlier. And it was definitely very inspiring as well as uh, enriching in terms of understanding uh, how rich the country, uh, our motherland India is. And I will be playing my small part in bringing down certain details about my side of the country, my side of the motherland, which is uh, Uttarakhand. So, uh, as Shristi has introduced me, uh, my name is Deepak Kumar and uh, at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, I am involved with uh, project uh, coordination, uh, mentoring, and I lecture on various IT topics. So, in their uh, uh, terminology, they call me IT specialist lecturer. And it's been around 10 years there and I've been thoroughly uh, enjoying it. Uh, I basically come from the state called Uttarakhand. Initially, the state was known as Uttaranchal. And the state was carved out from a very big state, uh, probably the largest state uh, at that time called Uttar Pradesh. Uh, people, especially in the hillside, uh, carried out a movement for a separate state, which was eventually, uh, which became a reality. And that is how Uttaranchal was formed. Later on, the state was renamed as Uttarakhand because the initial movement started by that name and people were very emotional about the word Uttarakhand. So that's the present name. And uh, it's a beautiful state sitting in the lap of uh, Himalayas on the north. And there are certain uh, factors, uh, there are certain uh, uh, facts about Uttarakhand, which uh, I would briefly introduce you to. Uttarakhand is called uh, Devabhumi, the land of gods. And I think rightly so, because it contains uh, 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 a very big list of religious uh, destinations. And it's basically a center for uh, tourism and herbal industry as well. So it shares its borders with uh, Tibet, which obviously is uh, a region controlled by China, with another country, Nepal, and it shares its uh, borders with uh, states like Himachal Pradesh and Uttar Pradesh. So the state has its winter capital as Dehradun. Dehradun was created as the initial capital of Uttarakhand, being one of the largest cities uh, and most developed cities in that area. But uh, the people in Uttarakhand felt that most of the government machinery resides in uh, Dehradun, and they uh, felt that the higher regions of Himalayas of Uttarakhand are a bit neglected. So they demanded that the the capital should either be shifted to uh, a town higher up called Gairsan. And there was a movement uh, for that, which is in Chamoli district. So in their own words, they used to, I, I heard that saying that, uh, you know, uh, and that was meant for the government officials that uh, uh, Babu Pahad Nahi Chadte Hain, which means <laughs> that uh, the government officials are reluctant to climb up the, the Himalayas because it's very chilly and uh, life is a bit difficult in, in especially in winter time there. So as a result of that, uh, now uh, in March, 2020, so the summer capital has been moved to Gaisen in Chamoli and the winter capital stays as Dehradun. Uh, Uttarakhand shares a very vast history in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, ancient Vedic ages uh, where it was a kingdom, kingdom called Uttarakuru, uh, and that was obviously uh, around, uh, I think, I think around 1000 BC. 
maybe even older. Uh, that's what uh, is documented. And uh, it has a, a legacy of uh, pilgrimage uh, towns uh, across Uttarakhand, uh, namely Haridwar, Rishikesh, Uttarkashi, Rudraprayag, Badrinath, and Kedarnath. So it's famous for its nature, splendor, and splendid uh, hill stations like Masuri, Nanital, Oli, Valley of Flowers. It has various uh, natural uh, or nature parks, uh, which are uh, reserve nature reserves like Jim Corbett National Park in Nanital, Rajaji National Park in Haridwar, Nana Devi uh, National Park in Chamoli. And as I said earlier, it's very much famous for its uh, spiritual uh, tourism as well as herbal industry. How do you reach Uttarakhand, uh, especially from Delhi? You basically take the uh, national highway, which is called National Highway 58, NH 58 from Delhi, and that takes you through Meerut and uh, bypasses another town called Muzaffarnagar and eventually reaches uh, an entry point into Uttarakhand called Rurki. Now it's, uh, I'm basically from Rurki, so I'm emotionally connected to the town as well. So I will take the opportunity to uh, shed a few light on the heritage of Rudki itself. Now Rudki is an educational center and it's basically known for its Indian Institute of Technology, uh, which was basically uh, reconstituted as uh, IIT in 2001. Initially, uh, Rudki, it was known as University of Rudki and it was very much revered and, and very much renowned for its uh, various departments of engineering, especially uh, Department of Civil Engineering, because it is the oldest civil engineering uh, uh, school or department in, in whole of Asia. So basically, Rurki was established. It's a small town. Initially, it was just a small kasba. And in 1847, it was established as a, a center for civil activities when the Ganga Canal or namely Upper Ganga Canal was constructed. Now Upper Ganga Canal is a, a man-made canal, constructed canal that starts from, uh, that emerges out from Ganga. In fact, the same uh, Holy Ganga uh, at Harki Pori in Haridwar where you take a dip. So that is an artificially created canal which draws the water out of main river Ganga. And that same river eventually flows into uh, Rudki, uh, where uh, I come from. So it was, it is known as a British era engineering marvels, and I'll, I'll share a few points about that as well. And because of this legacy, Rudki started developing as a, as a center of technological uh, study, learning, and uh, activity as well. And a college of Thomson College of Civil Engineering was established in Rudki in 1847. And uh, the British administrator of that area was uh, uh, an engineer called Thompson, who established it. So this was the first town uh, to have hydroelectricity, because when the Upper Gagan Canal was created, there were hydro hydroelectricity projects were installed as well. So it has many other attractions, and namely it has something called Irrigation Research Institute, uh, it is a center of Bengal engineering group known as Bengal Seppers. It has headquarters uh, in Rurki and it has its own history. And then there is a central building of research institute, CBRI, which is uh, under CSIR, uh, CSIR control at the moment, which was an independent uh, research institution on buildings uh, like earthquake prone buildings and uh, more uh, uh, environmental friendly buildings and all that research was carried out here. So I had the privilege of studying at two very important schools. One was a CBRI owned uh, rather managed school when I was uh, in my primaries. And the second one was uh, managed by University of Rurki that time, which was my high school and my intermediate school at that point of time. So. Okay, uh, so that was all about uh, Rurki. Now we enter into Haridwar. 
and Haridwar is the next destination when you enter into Haridwar, into Uttarakhand. And Haridwar, as the name suggests, basically is known as the gateway to heavenly abode. It's one of the most, uh, uh, you know, uh, a premier uh, religious centers for Hindus. And it's a starting point, or rather it's a, one of the uh, destinations for Char Dham Yatra, whereas uh, it is also called as a Chota Char Dham Yatra, which constitute a visit to uh, four different religious destinations like Rishikesh and upwards you go to Uttarkashi, Rudraprayag, Badrinath and Kedarnath. Haridwar hosts the Kumbh Mela, which is the, the largest human gathering uh, on this earth. And Haridwar is very much known and it's also known as a, a city of temple or a town of temples because it's full of uh, Asian temples. And it's a center for Ayurveda and naturopathy. So you may have heard about an uh, 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 organization called uh, Shanti Kunj, which is a very old uh, Ayurvedic organization where people go to get uh, various remedies for herbal. Uh, you must be aware of the famous uh, uh, called uh, uh, Pragya Pe Chai, or it is also known as Shanti Kunj Chai, which is a herbal tea, very famous, which comes out from Shanti Kunj. And uh, recently, Patanjali, which has obviously become a brand under Ramdev and uh, Acharya, uh, uh, which is uh, also very renowned uh, you know, and very popular for Ayurvedic, uh, Ayurvedic treatments and uh, Ayurveda itself. Then further you climb up to Rishikesh. Rishikesh is where the Ganga touches the plain uh, 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 from Himalayas. So Rishikesh is the town and it has several ashrams and it has various yoga retreats. So it's a, a center of spiritual learning and meditation and it has its own, uh, you know, uh, uh, various organized, various uh, institutions which are very renowned in terms of spiritual guidance. It is famous for its own, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, affiliations and, and uh, visits by various celebrities like uh, Beatles, Rolling Stones, uh, who have been visiting Maharishi Yogi Ashram quite, uh, you know, in their times. Uh, recently, you might have heard about uh, news of uh, Julia Roberts, who's a, uh, who follows Hindu uh, uh, religion uh, and coming and, uh, you know, visiting Rishikesh and Angelina Jolie and all those things. So all the celebrities keep on visiting uh, Rishikesh quite often which has become a center for spiritual experience and wellness as well, because there are a lot of uh, yoga retreats and there are various uh, ashrams over there, which impart well-being and uh, meditation and other religious learning education as well. These are some of the pictures of uh, some ashrams. This is obviously uh, Maharishi Yogi Ashram, as you can see here, which is also ironically known as Beetle Ashram because the Beetles came and visited there, and this is the the photograph of that showing up. Uh, other ashrams, there are many famous ashrams. I couldn't put all of them, uh, but one of them, this Paramat Niketan Ashram, uh, is a very beautiful one as well, apart from Gita Bhavan and uh, other different kind of ashrams that we have. Now, another, uh, as we have also discussed about Dehradun earlier, which is the winter capital of Uttarakhand, it is situated in Dune Valley. It's also a, a very pleasant town, which has many resident schools. It's famous for the, uh, you know, boarding schools like Dune School and Wilhelm and Kasigas and all other things. It is also very much renowned for uh, something called FRI, Forest Research Institute, which is the only research institute in forestry in India. So this is, uh, these are the pictures of uh, the, the Forest Research Institute. As you can see, it, was, it is a, a premium research institute for forestry, established in 1850, uh, 1878. And it was initially known as British, uh, British Imperial Forest School. And now it is a deemed university uh, since 1991. 
it is seven kilometers from Dehradun, and it is uh, at one stage it was listed in Guinness Book of World Record as the largest brick structure, uh, you know, on the earth. Probably now it may be overtaken by some other uh, developments. Let's talk about hill station briefly. So one of the hill station that you can uh, climb up from Dehradun and reach is Masuri, which is 35 kilometers from Dehradun and 290 kilometers from Delhi. It is also known as the, the Queen of Hills and it's a very famous tourist destination. There are some lovely pictures I have shown you up there. Okay, uh, the other one is Nenital. Uh, Nenital, uh, in fact, uh, I guess I have uh, forgotten to replace the pictures there. So the pictures are still showing Masuri. But Nenital is another hill station which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, around 345 kilometers from Delhi and 285 kilometers from Dehradun. It's a tourist destination in Kumau Hills. And it has a beautiful lake, an eye shaped lake. And that is how the name comes as Nani. So Nani means eyes and Tal means lake. That is how the town gets the name as Nanital. Sorry about uh, not being able to replace these pictures. Uh, then we have another hill station, which is Oli, which is higher up in uh, Himalayas. And this is basically a, a ski destination. So it's famous for hiking and ski. And it is 480 kilometers from Delhi and 270 kilometers from Dehradun. It hosted its first uh, South Asian Winter Games in 2011. And as you can see, the lovely picture shows you all the action. Uh, and it's uh, obviously carried with snow uh, throughout the year. And it's, it's a popular ski destination. So that's, a, I, I believe I am on time. Uh, so that's a, a small, small glimpse into Uttarakhand. And uh, I would encourage everybody and everybody to visit uh, and see all the splendors with your own very eyes. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deepak Ji, for that very knowledgeable insight on your state of Uttarakhand. Uh, we would now like to play a short video on the state of Uttarakhand. It is not without reason that this land is called Devabhumi, the land of gods. Snow-covered peaks, verdant valleys, dense forests, varied wildlife, yoga, Ayurveda and adventure. Uttarakhand has something for everyone. Let's savor a taste of what Uttarakhand has to offer. Breathtaking landscapes dotted with picturesque hill stations attract thousands of tourists in every season. These popular and well-known tourist destinations have captured the imagination of nature lovers for centuries. One with nature and God. As you embark upon a journey to the holiest of holy shrines, 
from the rush of the Ganges to the calm of the Himalayas. Feel divinity fill your senses and cleanse your soul. Envelop yourself with bhakti in the centuries old shrines. Scale the peaks. Rule the skies and conquer the cliffs. Unleash your spirit of adventure. Uttarakhand brings you face to face with elements that challenge you to push your own limits and test your mettle. Feel alive. Feel victorious. Lose your way in the dense forests and discover yourself. Every nook and cranny here hides a surprise. As you go deep in the jungle, you never know what the next turn will bring you face to face with. Tread the path less trodden and discover some of the most delightful but lesser known gems of Uttarakhand. Discover the Himalayas anew with these virgin spots and fall in love with the hills all over again. Meet the simple, hard-working folk and enjoy their hospitality. Step off the fast lane to rejuvenate yourself with ancient traditions of yoga and Ayurveda. Let Uttarakhand help you reconnect with your inner self and heal your mind and body.
tourism, adventure, wildlife, spirituality, wellness and a rich culture. It all comes together in Uttarakhand, the land of God's beckons. Come, explore the unexplored. Thank you. Mr. Vikram ja uh, Jamwal, a hotelier and the general manager of the Hilton Hotel Durban is now going to share his knowledge and history on the state of Delhi. Okay, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Vikram and uh, it's what an honor first of all to everyone uh, who is watching live and and absolutely uh, kudos to the Indian Consulate of, for setting up this platform to showcase and speak about uh, our beloved country, India. And, uh, and, and as we all know, Delhi, Dilwalonki, as we all know, uh, India has been, has been uh, uh, lucky enough to have the India as, uh, Delhi as a capital. And uh, this capital is 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 uh, been the heart for the Sultanate, and uh, for the last six seven hundred years, and then the Britishers took over, and since 1911, uh, when the year 1911 started, uh, the Britishers moved the capital from Calcutta and moved to right to Delhi. A uh, very interesting city, and uh, I have not prepared any notes, but I'll speak from my heart. I, I believe it's very important. Uh, I have studied in Delhi and there's a lot of good institutes, uh, a lot of historical institutes in India from, uh, from IIT to Delhi universities uh, to uh, uh, engineering colleges and, and, and now especially all the e-commerce and IT related is all setting up uh, a, a strong foundation for the future of, of digital India. Uh, that said, uh, Delhi is a very historical city. There's a lot of heritage and uh, the UNESCO itself, you know, in India, we have around 35 sites as, uh, and out of 35 sites, three sites itself are in, are in Delhi. You have home Himayu Tom, which was made in 15th century. You have uh, Kutlam Minar and the Red Fort. And, and we are very privileged in that terms because a lot of tourist influx gets into Delhi. Uh, it's because of the great uh, international uh, airport we have, and, and, and that becomes a transit point. Because if you look at the Delhi map, uh, it is connected uh, or just linked with Rajasthan, which is uh, the, the neighboring city. You have Uttar Pradesh, uh, where you have Taj Mahal, and as we said, Rajasthan, where you have all the old palaces. So there's a lot of tourist influx comes in. That said, uh, in Delhi, you have a, a amazing food experience uh, because it's a mixture of Mughlai food, which is yummy all the time. Uh, you have Punjabi food, which is all your, uh, you know, the chatpata food, the spicy food, the oily food, which makes you fat, but they're still yummy and delicious all the time. Uh, and the music, uh, you have, uh, as we said, the, you know, the, all the big fat weddings happens in Delhi. You have all the big musicals happens in Delhi. And, and uh, this makes always uh, Delhi, as I said before, Dilwalonki. Uh, and I will only encourage you to, to everyone who lives in Durban or in South Africa, you should, must come to Delhi and, and enjoy uh, the true hospitality uh, of Indian culture, uh, because it's a great mix of, uh, of, of, of the cultures which has been traditionally for the last 1000 years and therefore you will see how interesting it is to be in delhi uh, the temperatures are quite hot in hotter days so it can go up to 48 degrees but same time during cold time during winter times it goes up to uh, goes down to uh, primarily around zero degrees so, it's, so you shiver when it's winter and it's really sweat when it's high summer which is now which is now delhi in the middle of getting into the summer board and, and we should not forget, you know, the Delhi is all about politics, is all about all the big powers sitting in Delhi who, who think and plan about Indian politics, about the Indian uh, development and about the Indian growth. 
and we are privileged uh, to feel uh, that experience uh, every time. And I'm sure on during the 26th uh, January, you see that parade, which happens at the Rajpat, where you see the uh, amazing uh, the armed forces, how they parade, uh, and you have thousands of people from Delhi who will come and watch that parade happening. And, uh, and that's it. So it's a quite a happening town. It's a quite a happening city. And uh, there's a lot of future, which is setting up on the right manner for our youth. And, uh, and therefore, do plan and come to Delhi very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Vikramji, for that insight on the state of Delhi. Delhi ke nithaye kuche aur aa ke musabbar hain jo shakl nazar aai, tasveer nazar aai. India, incredible India. Our next speaker this evening um, is Ms. Uh, Fari Jamwal. Uh, Fariji is a preschool teacher here in Durban, as well as a writer, poet, and a mother for her heritage and legacy on the state of Jammu Kashmir.
Okay, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. And uh, it's an ultimate pleasure to be talking about my stage in Jammu Kashmir. It's very, very close to my heart because I'm born there. I've been brought up there and I've lived uh, more than um, 23 years of my life there. So whatever I will speak about Jammu and Kashmir is all about my experiences I've had there and uh, the sweetest memories I have in my heart and mind about my beloved uh, state. So Jammu and Kashmir was primarily uh, a state uh, which was a princely state and its last ruler was Maharaja Hari Singh. It is now a union territory comprising of three different regions, uh, Jammu, Kashmir and Ladakh. So it's uh, very important to understand that these three regions are very different from each other in terms of geography and in terms of culture. Uh, but they mutually enjoy each other and uh, they are blooming at its best. So um, uh, let's start with Jammu first. Uh, Jammu is a Hindu dominant region and uh, the spoken language there is Dogri. Like I am a Dogri myself. So before I talk further about Jammu, I would like to sing a few lines for my dear Jammu <laughs> in Dogri. Uh, and here it goes. Mitti diye dogri di boli te khand mitte do log dogre. Mitti diye dogri di boli te khand mitte log dogre. So this means that uh, the dogri language is the sweetest of all, and dogra people are also the sweetest among everybody on planet Earth. Um, and to say further, I would say Dogri is a language that um, resembles Punjabi a lot. If you know Punjabi, you can understand Dogri. And uh, even it, uh, it has a few words which, are, which resemble Hindi. So it's not a language which is very, uh, very difficult to be understood. It's very easy. It's very sweet to your ears. And uh, it can be easily learned. Um, what else I can tell you about the Dogri food? Uh, I would uh, like to say that the cuisine is very rich. It's very yum. And um, what I myself, my favorite is, uh, is the Rajma Chawal with Ambal. That's the red kidney beans with some basmati rice uh, and some pumpkin curry that is uh, made with a lot of tamarind and uh, sugar and some gur. Uh, and Jammu is famous for its pickles. Uh, there are lots of uh, staple fruit and dry fruits in Jammu, and uh, we can make a lot of uh, a lot of variety of pickles out of those things. So Jammu is famous for the pickles. Uh, to name a few, I would say uh, kim da achar. Then we say lasure da achar and uh, tiao da achar. These are some of the pickles which uh, a Dogri uh, fellow can really enjoy, and it's like finger licking good. Um, uh, to add a few more things, a few more dishes to the Dogri cuisine, I would say uh, it, uh, there's something called khatta meat, which is uh, very popular in Jammu. Uh, and uh, some of the dals, like uh, chana ki dal, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a way they make this dal and uh, with a lot of fennel seeds into it, uh, which adds to a flavor and gives it a distinct taste. So because I'm a foodie and I like Jammu food a lot, so that's why I'm telling you how it is. Um, what else I can tell you about the Dobri cuisine? Yeah, a lot of uh, sweets, you know, we have uh, um, sweets like, uh, um, like we have our special, uh, uh, special making of uh, sweets, you know, like our special jalebis uh, and special halvas. So these are the these are the few things, you know, which uh, uh, which a Dogri cuisine uh, includes. And it's really very different from other things. Um, Dogri dresses. Uh, Dogri dresses are also very exquisite because uh, the way they are made, we call them salwar kameez. Again, they resemble a lot with Punjabi suits. Uh, it has a lot of uh, gota, tapka work on it, you know, hand woven embroidery. And um, 
the texture is uh, almost silk and uh, a lot of hand hand woven embroidery you could see on dogri dresses um, uh, and uh, jammu is famous actually jammu is uh, jammu is situated at the banks of uh, river tavi and uh, it's famous for its temples and that's why we call it a city of temple so a lot of uh, a lot of temples like Raghunath temple is there which is a very unique it's in, own, in its own way because uh, it's uh, it's it has a uh, gold uh, gold walls like gold plated walls there and a lot of gold work there it's uh, made in the early 19th century um, and uh, it's basically made on the on the theme of uh, Ramayana so all the all the god gods and goddesses you see in the Ramayana, you could uh, see them there. The idols are sitting there. Uh, this is how this is why it is unique. And we have a library there, you know, with our Sanskrit, uh, with our Sanskrit uh, uh, manuscripts. So a lot of books, more than six thousand uh, six thousand manuscripts are there, and uh, you can enjoy them all there. Uh, and the other temples, I would say the Ran Ranbireshwar temple is one of the temples which is uh, very popular there. Um, and uh, the most the most important place in Jammu, why the whole world comes to Jammu, is Mata Vaishnu Devi Shrine. So the pilgrimage is is awesome and it it's an experience uh, of its own kind uh, because you have to trek a mountain called Trikuta. Uh, like a 12 kilometer trek and you reach a cave where the goddess is sitting in the form of uh, three natural rock formation uh, Lakshmi, Durga and Saraswati and the whole ambience is like it's mystical so people all around the world come there for uh, Maita Vaishnu Devi Darshan uh, and uh, they are blessed they come when they are wishes are fulfilled and uh, uh, it's it's a blessing to be there so these are some of the things why jammu is famous and why people come from different parts of the world to jammu and to add that i would say uh, some of the very important forts of jammu like the bahu fort and the mubarak mandi fort is also a thing uh, like uh, a I think uh, what really amazes people because of its architecture, um, you can see a lot of uh, Greek influence um, and Iranian influence in the architecture of these ports, uh, and uh, it's beautiful. So these are some of the things which I personally rejoice being in Jammu, and uh, I see my family, my friends, like you know my relatives, they enjoy going there, seeing the seeing all this and. Uh, uh, next is the Kashmir. If we talk about Kashmir, we all know it's a paradise on earth and uh, it's surrounded by Himalayas and some mystifying lakes, some pine trees and flower beds. Uh, uh, Kashmir is really breathtakingly beautiful. Personally speaking, when I was a teenager and the first time I went to Kashmir, uh, I, was, uh, I was amazed. I could not believe that uh, what my eyes are seeing. Uh, Kashmir is a Muslim dominant region and the language uh, people of Kashmir speak is Kashmiri, which is really very uh, unique in its own way because it's, it doesn't resemble any other language and uh, it's very different. Um, Kashmiri people enjoy uh, Vazwan, which is a multi-course cuisine. Uh, it includes a lot of uh, a lot of uh, meat uh, made in different formats and in different flavors, uh, which is followed by a yummy kawa. I'm sure you all know about Kashmiri kawa. It's it's very popular in India, um, and uh, Kashmiris they uh, they wear something called firan, like their dress is firan, which is like a long shirt uh, made up of warmer stuff. Um, and uh, you can see a, if a woman is wearing a firan, it uh, has to have a lot of embroidery, which is again, uh, uh, it, it is influenced by the Kash Jammu and Kashmir motif, a 
a lot of chinar patta with some dabka and some tilla work on it, you know, with a special golden thread. So uh, you can see the culture in their food, in their, uh, in their clothing, um, in their homes, you know, in the decorative pieces they have in their houses. So uh, because a lot of handwork which is influenced by Iran, you can see it there. Um, and uh, uh, to continue, I would say, uh, yeah, Kashmiri Pashmina shawls are very famous. They're worldwide famous. Uh, and the Kashmiri weaved carpets, then uh, paper mache artifacts. And uh, the most favorite for, for me is the walnut furniture, which is uh, carved and uh, which is beautiful because uh, the way it looks, it's really beautiful. And the handwork, I mean, the handicraft you see on those furniture, you know, it's very, very beautiful. Uh, to add more, I would say, if you are a tourist, of course, you would want to visit some of the places to see. So if you are a tourist, you must go to Nishad Bagh, Shalimar Bagh, Chashme Shahi. Uh, these are some of the floral gardens of Kashmir. And uh, they were made by the Mughals. Uh, of course, they are, they are very different, the way they are made. The features are very different. They are these lined uh, pine trees and the flower beds. They have these uh, water springs flowing uh, from the center of the garden, and uh, uh, they are beautiful. They are beautiful. I mean, uh, you really have to go there to see it. Uh, it cannot be put in words. And uh, Gulmark for skiing, because uh, during winters, Kashmir is all uh, about snow, about ice, and people enjoy skiing in Gulmark. Um, and then uh, I would say, um, the Dal Lake, the most important uh, place to visit Kashmir is the Dal Lake. It has the it has the uh, houseboats basically, the houseboats by the lilies. You know, it's an experience of its own kind. The first houseboat was made in 1888 for housing some British guests, and from there on. Uh, there are numerous houseboats that came into being and they are catering to the tourists there and giving them an awesome experience. Um, then uh, in the Dal Lake, you know, uh, early morning, they also have uh, these floating vegetable market where you actually buy these uh, uh, lily stems, uh, some kind of sog like the herbs, uh, leafy vegetables and flowers. So it's also an experience of its kind. And um, uh, Dal Lake is beautiful. It's surrounded by these flowers and the and the pine trees again, um, and uh, it's it's beautiful. I mean, again, I would say that you have to be there to experience it. And the way the uh, the sailor would sing you in Kashmiri, you know, some of the few songs. This is why all, most of the times, you know, you see uh, earlier Bollywood movies were shot in Kashmir because. Uh, because uh, you can't compare Kashmir with any other place, uh, especially in India. So Kashmir visit is a must visit, I guess. Uh, to add more, I would say uh, when I went there, I had gone to a few temples there. One temple, I mean, uh, one of the temples uh, was Kir Bhavani Temple. Uh, it's also a very old temple uh, where goddess is residing and uh, there are a few more shrines like Amarnath and uh, uh, some more uh, uh, shrines like the Muslim mosques. I, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't remember the names clearly, but uh, some of the mosques are very, very, very popular there and you see a lot of people visiting them. Um, so Kashmir is a mix of everything, you know. And uh, you enjoy being there. I mean, if you go there, you enjoy every day, every moment of your uh, presence there. So lastly, I would like to come to Ladakh, uh, which uh, I really want to visit uh, sometime soon. But uh, I'm sure, I mean, uh, what I've heard and what my parents tell me is that it's also a heaven on earth because of its landscapes and uh, the lakes uh, Ladakh has and the uh, Buddhist uh, monasteries. You know, Ladakh is Buddhist dominant, and the people there are very shy, very humble, and uh, very, very hospitable. 
So, I mean, I hear from my friends who have visited there that uh, they have had an awesome experience uh, with the local, with the local people there. The spoken language is Ladakhi, which is also very, um, very unique. And uh, you can't understand Ladakhi because it doesn't resemble to any other language in India. And uh, Ladakhi cuisine, again, I would say, is very unique because uh, Ladakhi people, they love to have soups, dumplings, breads, and momos. And uh, because it's also influenced by some Tibetan food habits and food cultures. So it's very different from uh, what we eat in Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, Ladakhi people, they like to wear long rope kind of dresses, which are uh, made up of these thick leathers and some fur to keep them warm because the temperature rises there uh, to minus 45 degrees. It's very, very cold there. And uh, that's why we uh, also have cold deserts in Ladakh with where you can see some twin humped camels also. Uh, and uh, uh, to talk more about Ladakh, uh, I would say the uh, places of interest there are Pangyong Lake, and a uh, few valleys like uh, Nubra Valley. And uh, there are many more valleys uh, which you really need to go and uh, find yourself because they are very beautiful. And uh, a, a place called Magnetic Hill is also one of the tourist attraction uh, why people go. Um, and uh, the temperature in Ladakh, as I said, it goes to minus 45 degrees. So it makes... Uh, Ladakh very dry and cold, but uh, you have places there because Ladakh uh, is a place which uh, is also uh, which is also like the highest plateau in India. So you have a very clear view of uh, sky for the uh, if you want to uh, see stars and all you know like the Milky Way. They say that you have a clear view of Milky Way if you see from those regions in Ladakh. So people go there for stargazing and they enjoy the view of stars. Uh, it's very clear and um, you don't need telescopes. So this is a few of the things, you know, what Jammu and Kashmir has to offer you and the, and the people aspiring uh, to visit Jammu Kashmir sometime soon. That is all. This is all my experience, what I'm telling you. Uh, again, I've also not uh, prepared any notes or any... <laughs> slides to show you the pictures but uh, no pictures can I guess uh, uh, create a difference because you really have to be there to experience it all and uh, to feel the difference uh, you have to be personally there to see everything because it's it's an experience which uh, which can't be replaced by anything else so thank you very much that's it thank you so much uh, Fariji on that very knowledgeable deep insight on your state of Jammu and uh, Kashmir. <laughs> we will now be playing a short video on the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Kashmir is sleeping. Let's समझ गया सर ड्राइवर का नाम है मीर लाल रंग की गाड़ी है दो मिनट में पहुंच रहे बस कश्मीर क्या खड़े रहने आई हो चलो आई थिंक दिस इज द वन मीर साहब फ्रॉम शेख ट्रैवल्स सॉरी सर थोड़ा लेट हो गए इसी की वजह से हम चले चले डोंट बी लेट ऑन एक्सप्रेस दो मिनट थैंक यू दो मिनट लगते हैं यार 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 बट यू हेलो हाँ ला रहा हूँ ला रहा हूँ कोई बात माफ करे बेगम का फोन था उठा नहीं पड़ा नहीं ठीक है सर वो तो उठाना ही पड़ता कहाँ चल रहे सर डल्लेक डल्लेक हाँ डल्लेक डल्लेक चल बशीर पक्कियापुर पश्चाश दिस इज़ सो नाइस ये ये वाला ज़्यादा खूबसूरत है चलिए
से बेगम ने चीनी लाने के लिए भेजा था रास्ते में आप दोस्त मिल गए तो मैंने सोचा चलो ये आपको अपना घर दिखाते हैं कश्मीर दिखाते हैं आइए ठंड बढ़ रही है आग जलाते हैं आइए आइए पहचाने माएर स्टेट ऑफ छत्तीसगढ़ I would like to welcome Ms Geeta Joshi who is a qualified chemical engineer and a quality engineer and a and private automotive manufacturing company in South Africa. Everybody can hear me clearly. Uh first of all thank you for inviting me Shashi. it's uh i'm quite nervous and excited uh cuz i haven't attended anything of the sort uh, since i moved to south africa so first of all i would like to explain a few things about myself i've lived uh, in india my entire life uh, i worked there i studied there and i moved to south africa in 2013 um and then i stayed in durban for 2 years and eventually i relocated to joburg um so a few things about uh, chatisgarh uh, well i also haven't prepared a uh, presentation or <laughs> i made a few notes though but uh, i would also like to speak speak from my heart or as much as i can remember having been uh, there for the past 4 years so <laughs> the memories are a bit faded but uh, there's a lot of uh, time that i spend uh, uh, when i was uh, studying and when i was growing up uh, um and then um also uh when i worked uh, uh in the same state um so uh first of all i would like to start with uh the name itself uh chatisgarh uh, it's one of the 28 states of india located in the uh center east of the country so uh, if if you can understand uh, hindi then you would you can actually break it down and understand the meaning of it chatis means 36 and gird means is a fort so uh basically what uh, is derived from uh 36 forts uh, uh in the state um uh not necessarily i'm not sure how true that is but that have been said that we have 36 forts in the in the state or the district uh and that's why it's called chatisgarh um it is the ninth largest state in india 
uh, with a population of around 3.3 crores as of 2020. So it's, it's quite uh, heavily populated, but apart from uh, that, it's a, it's a uh, resource-rich uh, uh, resource state. We have a lot of uh, coal mines, uh, bauxite, limestone, marble. Uh, so uh, even though it's far away from main cities like Mumbai, Delhi, and uh, Kerala, uh, people don't know much about Chhattisgarh because the tourism maybe is not uh, you know, uh, promoted as much as main cities because it's not really connected to uh, 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 what you call it uh, overseas or other countries. Uh, you have to basically land uh, Mumbai or Delhi first uh, and then take another plane uh, all the way to to the nearest uh, uh, airport that's that's in Raipur, that's the capital city of the of the state. So it's far away uh, from from all the major cities, at least uh, two hours away if you if you if you're taking a flight. Uh, so, uh, but there is a lot of things um, uh, that one can see in Chhattisgarh if you if you're willing to come and uh, you know take that uh, long. Uh, uh, flight to to Mumbai and Delhi and take another flight to to Raipur. That's the that's the uh, capital of the of the state. Um, but uh, Chhattisgarh wasn't uh, a, a state on its own. Uh, it was formed on the first of November two thousand uh, by uh, separating a lot of states uh, from Madhya Pradesh. Uh, so it was. Uh, it it wasn't it was part of Madhya Pradesh up until 2000, uh, first November 2000. So Chhattisgarh borders the states of Madhya Pradesh, uh, Uttar Pradesh, Jharkhand, and Maharashtra, um, and uh, a lot of its uh, resources, uh, power, electricity, uh, all these things are distributed around uh, all the other states in the country. So. There are different origins, uh, different opinions about the origin of the name, though, uh, and, and its significance because uh, it's been said that uh, it's a native place of uh, of Rama. So uh, the origin of the name actually came uh, because of uh, it used to be called as uh, Dakshina Koshala, and that that is actually coming from Koshalya, that was the daughter of uh, of the of the king Naresh. So um, it's 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 uh, it. I think it used to be a very popular, um, uh, uh, you know, state at the time of the Maratha Empire. So um, apart from um, you know uh, all these uh, uh, resources that are available in the country, it's it's the uh, it's heavily uh, forested. There's a lot of waterfalls. Um, there's a lot of lakes and and and. Not very close to Kerala, but there's a lot of green stuff, especially during the season of uh, monsoons. There's a lot of rain. There's a lot of uh, uh, you know natural uh, stuff that one can uh, observe and 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 uh, look at. Um, if you look at the uh, separation of Chhattisgarh, uh, it actually uh, happened in 2000, and then uh, uh, it, it 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 helped the state improve a lot. Uh, as far as I can remember, when when we were younger, they it wasn't uh, much developed. But uh, once it was separated from Madhya Pradesh, it gained a lot of importance in terms of power, uh, electricity, aluminium, and all these other infrastructures that that the city or the state could provide to other cities uh, in, in the country. So that's how the development started once it was separated from Madhya Pradesh. So the main cities uh, in Chhattisgarh are Raipur. Uh, which is the capital city of the of the of the state? Then we have Bilaspur, Bilai, and Korba. And Korba is a, is a city that uh, I come from. So the state is not connected well by the airport, as you would uh, think. Uh, how is it in, normally in South Africa? The main uh, tra um, means of transport still remains railroads or buses or uh, your own uh, public transport, your own personal transport, but. Uh, as I said before, one can go to Raipur first and then discover the, the other cities uh, surrounding uh, the, the the local cities or the local culture or the art of the of the of the state. Um, also, that uh, it's uh, also called the the bowl of uh, uh, of rice because of the rice uh, uh, irrigation or 
uh, the abundance of rice in the region. Uh, agriculture is counted as the most uh, of the chief, chief economic uh, occupation in Chhattisgarh. Uh, a lot of people are basically dependent on um, irrigation, uh, rice, wheat, and all the other local uh, lentils that you might not get in South Africa, but are local to, to, to India. Um, it's also ranked as the uh, 17th largest uh, tea producing uh, state of India. Um, it is uh, very self-sufficient when it comes to power, electricity, because uh, there's a lot of um, uh, power plants, CSEB, uh, that's the central board of electricity that also supplies electricity to a lot of other, other states in the country. Uh, we have National Thermal, uh, Thermal Power Corporation plant that also provides electricity. Um, we have Balco, uh, that's also a manufacturing plant for aluminum that provides aluminum to all other sectors that requires uh, uh, aluminum for their own manufacturing uh, um, uh, uh, requirements and stuff like that. So um, uh, basically, it's a lot of uh, job uh, opportunities. For a lot of uh, people who study engineering, uh, because as 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 um, as we heard earlier by Mr. Deepak, that uh, Ruki is also an engineering institute. We also have a lot of engineering institutes that people study, and then eventually these are the uh, the the companies like NTPC and Balco and. Uh, the steel plant that we have, uh, eventually, uh, you know, the students are allocated jobs in these uh, these companies. So there's a lot of uh, um, uh, job scope for students who are actually engineering students. Uh, there's a lot of learning and growth opportunities apart from tourism that needs to be promoted much more than it has been promoted for uh, major cities like Kerala and, and uh, Delhi and Mumbai. So, contrary to the normal uh, conception, it's uh, even though it's situated in the center of the country, it's uh, quite modern. It's culturally very developed. Uh, uh, there is uh, ab abundance of food or, or, or variety of food available, depending on uh, meat eaters or vegetarians, or, or you get every kind of uh, uh, meal that you're looking for. Um, so apart from all these uh, things, we have a lot of hills, we have a lot of dams, we have a, a lot of uh, waterfalls surrounding each and every city in the state. So uh, being located in the in the um, uh, part, in such in the center part of the India, it 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 it, it does not attract a lot of uh, uh, tourism, but it it has uh, plenty of things to offer uh, for people who want to to visit uh, India and eventually Chhattisgarh. So uh, that's my experience, uh, what I've observed in the past 27 years that I lived in, in the state, and uh, I'm sure people who visit uh, would definitely enjoy the experience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gita Ji, for that very insightful uh, remarks on your state of Chhattisgarh. We will now be playing a short video on the state of Chhattisgarh.
Thank you. We've come to the end of today's program, and without further ado, we've come to the vote of thanks for this evening. And for that, I present to you Mushiro Banwari Lal. Thank you, Shristi. On behalf of the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center at the Consulate General of India in Durban, I would like to express our deep gratitude and say thank you to Mr. Mohan Nair. I would like to say a huge thank you to Mr. Deepak Kumar Chaudhary. I would like to express our deep gratitude and say thank you to Mr. Vikram Jamal. I would like to say a huge thank you to Ms. Fari Jamwal. I would like to express our deep gratitude and say thank you to Ms. Geeta Joshi. Thank you once again to all our guest speakers for taking time of your busy schedule to join us for today's program. I would like to thank Ms. Kavita Salanki for that beautiful song and Ms. Shristi Harinarayan for being our lovely MC. I would like to say thank you to Mr. Piyush Kandawir for all the technical support and making all our online programs a success. Stay home and stay safe. Thank you.